Hello everyone. The Harp of India by Henry De Rosio. It is included in your course Indian Literature in English, Semester 5, B.A. English Language and Literature, and I am Sarsha. Before we move into the poem, I would like to show you or introduce you the musical instrument harp. This is the musical instrument harp. This is a string instrument and uh, con that consisting of a frame supporting a graduated series of parallel strings played by plucking with the fingers. This is a poet. Henry Vivian de Rosio. He is the first Indian, the first English Indian poet who also headed the Young Bengal movement. Despite having little Indian blood in his veins, he loved India. He was a child of Indo-Portuguese father and a British mother. The poem the Harp of India is a nostalgic poem by Henry de Rosio. It celebrates the magnificent Indian past and laments over the loss that is caused by the British rule. The poem ends with the hope that one day India will regain its glory. So the poem is actually written at the time when uh, the British, uh, India was under the British rule. So that is why he is saying that um, the poem, um, uh, he is expecting at the end of the poem that one day India will regain its glory. That is what has uh, happened after that and that is what is experienced uh, by us uh, right now. In the current, in the present scenario, we have uh, see, till now we have seen a lot number of wonderful literary uh, literary pieces, uh, magnificent uh, um, writers till now, uh, and uh, we have talked about all those Indian English writers in the previous class. The word harp was used by the poet for the famous Indian poets who, under the British rule, are now suffering. The poem is an unconventional sonnet having a rhyming scheme A B A B B A B C D C D C B B. The poem is divided into two main parts. In the first part the poet laments on the magnificent past while in the second part he hopes for the glory to be gained, regained. I'll read the poem once let's re read the poem once why hangs thou lonely on yon withered bow on strong forever must thou there remain thy music once was sweet who hears it now why doth the breeze sigh over thee in vain Silence hath bound thee with her fatal chain. Neglected, mute, and desolate art thou, like ruined monument on desert plain. Oh, many a hand more worthy far than mine. Once thy harmonious chord to sweetness gave, and many a wreath for them did fame entwine of flowers still blooming on the minstrel's grave. Those hands are cold, but if thy notes divine may be by mortar wakened once again, harp of my country, let me strike the strain. So let's try to um, understand line by line. Why hangs thou? Lonely on yon withered bow, unstrung forever must thou there remain. Thy music once was sweet. So, um, the, the word harp, we can um, see, although the word harp is not uh, 
uh, given uh, in the in any of these lines we can see uh, the word harp in the uh, title of the poem harp is a metaphor for indian poetic tradition or indian literary tradition the poets whose melodies were sweet and lost their glory under the british rule the harp by harp he means the poets whose melodies were sweet and lost their glory under the british rule thus they are unstrung see unstrung forever because they uh, they are unstrung because they, they uh, there is no glory it is um, faded under the british rule who hears it now why does the breeze sigh over thee in vain nobody listens to them now because of the development and the modernity due to the intervention of the british rule and little hope and struggle little, little means no hope okay little hope no hope and struggle cannot make them right again see who hears it now nobody listens to them why does the breeze sigh over thee in vain why does why does okay uh that means it's an old usage we are we no longer use uh this doth uh we uh use does d-o-e-s does why does the breeze sigh over thee thee means you in vain nobody listens to them now because of the development and the modernity development and modernity due to the intervention of the british rule we had uh, the poets like kalidasa pasa um, like that and nobody is uh, listening to all those literary pieces because of the intervention of the british rule everybody is behind the western uh, culture tradition and literature uh, it doesn't mean that uh, western literature is uh, less important but every literature is important uh, ne- uh, our indian literature is important as well as the british literature is also important and little hope and struggle cannot make them right again why does the breeze sigh over thee in vain the breeze cannot make any change that is um uh, no i mean uh there is no hope that the this little breeze the little struggle the the feeble struggle will um uh, will not uh, make any change in the uh, literary world silence has bound thee with her fatal chain neglected mute and desolate art thou like ruined monument on desert plain silence hath silence means it's a metaphorical uh, term for death of poetry death of poetry now the indian literary or indian poetry became silent silence has bound thee that means silence has hugged you silence has um trapped inside in it you became silent now indian poetry became silent now with her fatal chain okay with its fatal chain the indian poetry became silent now okay british restricted these poets from writing so they are like ruined and neglected monument in the desert they are ruined they are ruined and neglected monument it's like a neg- ruined and destroyed and neglected monument uh, in the desert now indian poetry is like uh, destroyed destroyed and neglected monument in the desert nobody is seeing it nobody is watching it nobody is praising its um, artistic value Let the speaker begins with the question of why hangst thou lonely on yon withered bough the word thou speaks of the harp humans 
humans here addressing the harp harp means the po indian poetic tradition and more specifically the people of india are the indian poetic tradition the poet is wandering over the lonely hanging harp on the dry and dead bow bowman's branch of a tree okay dead bow and asks for the reason why are you hanging why are you hanging lonely he is asking why are you hanging long lonely hence the poem begins with the melancholy and the sad tone the speaker in the next line suggests that it that means the harp suggests that the harp will forever remain with a dead bow without strings okay just like the dead branch the harp is also dead uh, the branch is dead and also the harp is red dead furthermore the speaker is nostalgic and refer to the past when the music of harp was quite meaningful and sweet the music of uh, the hanging dead uh, harp was once once it was so meaningful and sweet okay every time he calls or he ad he addresses uh, the harp we have to think that we we don't forget that he is addressing he is actually addressing the indian poetry so he is saying that your music was once so sweet and meaningful it uh, contained a lot of meaning when it was not unstrung it would have sweet melodies now the strings are removed there is no more strings on the harp now it cannot have any music it doesn't have any music now and no one listens to it anymore nobody is listening to it because it doesn't have any music every every strings has removed from that harp the harp is too old to be played now it is too old nobody is playing it now because there is no strings no music no uh, no one to play the strings of the harp moreover the harp cannot wake up by the breeze or air that passes by it any any breeze breeze is a meager one right it's just a meager one it cannot make any change like uh, a storm makes a change so a breeze cannot make a change in the air it cannot wake the harp up simply in other words the words are useless to play it it is now dead by the silence and unmusicality the harp is now dead and it is unmusical now as a very old cenotaph in the desert it is subdued abandoned and ruined it is destroyed harp in the poet in the poem the harp of india uh, there is a mistake it's not poet but it's um, poem it's a typo sorry for that harp in the poem the harp of india refers to that past dead indian poets who once sung the melodious and sweet poetry and then lost their magnificence in the tiring british rule in india hence there are unstrung poets and nobody wants to listen to their worthy and meaningful poems this is all this all is caused by the new developments and modernity by the british developments means uh, developments in the field of um, culture literature language and all okay N nothing is in, um, i mean uh, nothing other is meant by this development i mean exactly the development and modernity that has entered into the field of culture um, literature language and education according to uh, the poet according to the poet the past poets are so dead and uh, silent that the little breeze uh, referring to the struggle is not enough to put life in them actually by this he means that it's not completely dead some um, small small uh, development and movements are happening um, 
here and there uh, in india but it is not a unanimous movement or it right, is not so big movement like a storm comes so it cannot uh, he is saying okay um or we can read in the way that it cannot make any change in the field of poetry the poet uses the word silence that refers to the metaphorical death of the poetry of these poets the british restricted them from writing that made them like the old neglected silenced and ruined monument in the desert oh many uh, now, from now uh, actually the poem is divided into two parts and uh, the first part ends there and the second part begin uh, second part begins here that has a um a, a, a color of hope the first part was completely sad uh, filled with sadness sadness and hopelessness but this part the second part is filled with hopefulness it is filled with hope hope that one day uh, the uh, harp will begin to sing the indian poetry tradition the uh, indian poetic tradition will uh, resurrect re, um, will uh, um, uh, uh, will um, take a birth again oh many a hand more worthy far than mine once thy harmonious chords to sweetness gave here hand means a hand of the poet or the poets lived before the poet oh many hand many hand that the uh, many hands of the poets uh, here by uh, by the word hand he is referring to the poets poets lived before the poet uh, and marvelous they all wrote marvelous poetry their immortal work has kept them alive even today and thus they live in spite of being in the grave that's why we all um, talk about kalidasa bhasa and all those uh, very eminence uh, all of their literary brilliance even now and many a wreath of them for them did fame and wine of flowers still blooming on the minstrel's grave those hands are cold but if thy notes divine may be by mortal wakened once again harp of my country let me strike the strain let me strike the strain poet says that they that means those elites are dead those poets that those poetic elites are dead now he desires to revive the literature and thus bring the glory of indian culture back which is lost now and uh, the second part of the poem begins with a morning tone morning means lamenting yet ends with hope Okay. Uh, although the second part has a morning tone, it ends with a hope. Okay, that's why I said the second part has a tone of a hope. The speaker shifts his interest from the harp, a uh, musical instrument, to the uh, to the one who used the harp to sound melodies, that is poets. The speaker points out the past poets before him. whose poems were more worthy and melodious than his he says that those poets produced outstanding poetry that would make the listeners enjoyable though these poets are now dead all of those poets are now dead they are no more yes their works have kept them alive and immortal although they are dead those works are so powerful uh, and it has uh, so powerful that it could able to make keep the uh, literary world um 
or uh, that um, keep uh, this uh, present poets alive or immortal or we can say um, or in the other way we can say uh, their works are so uh, live their uh, works are so uh, in, uh, energetic and brilliant so that uh, even though nobody is reading their poetry um, in a popular manner all those works are still alive because of their classy classiness because of their brilliance of the poetry because of their work they are always honored and will be honored in the coming years hence even after their death they are still alive just as the flowers still blooms on their graves at the end of the poem the poets refer to the poets refer to past poet the, the poet okay <laughs> here and there i could find um, some typos yeah, the poet okay the poet refers to past poets and called cold hands dead hands however the poet a speaker desires to revive the past literary works of those poets and hopes that by reviving that work the indian glory will also be revived the word hands in the second part of the poem refers to the poets before the poet those poets wrote amazing poetry brilliant poetry though these poets are now dead yet their works have kept them alive uh, and immortal they are immortal those poet those poets are immortal through their poetry their poetic works because of their work because of their works they are always honored and will be honored in the coming ages hence even after their death they are still alive just as a flower still blooming uh, in their graves the poet desires to revive the past literary works of those poets and hopes that by reviving the that work the indian glory will also be revived the only recurring theme of the poem is colonization all this has happened because of the colonization of britain the poem was written in the 19th century during that era the world particularly india was going through the period of colonization the british raj or british rule has drastic impacts on the people and literary developments the poet in the poem refers to the instruments uh, as we third that means dead he says that they are untouched for years resulting in its rusting before the arrival of the british empire the poetry produced in india has an idealistic tone making the music beautiful yet after they are empowered by others the beauty is lost empowered is used in a negative tone okay uh because every everyone were in, interested uh, attached to the western education and the culture all those uh, indian literary tradition were lost and the poets have stopped practicing due to the restrictions imposed on them there were also so much of restrictions imposed upon the writers at during those period the poet highlights the importance of a culture and that was lost because of the colonization with the loss of culture the beauty and the worth of those poets also diminished loss of culture doesn't uh, doesn't mean that we all have lost our culture but uh just uh, uh he just means or we can read in a way that uh, our culture was influenced by the western culture that's all um our culture want we uh, we won't lose any um culture it will always remain in us in um in our soil but uh, sometimes we will forget it that's all here he uh means or here we can read in a way that the indians were most of the indians were influenced by the western or the uh, western culture the poets were writers were uh, attached uh, attracted towards the western culture literature language and uh, 
education. The development and modernization by the colonizers made the colonized to adopt their way of living and assimilate in their foreign culture. The natives have lost their identities and are oppressed. There are three literary devices used in the poem. The first one is simile. A simile is a figure of speech that makes a comparison, showing similarities between two different things. Unlike a metaphor, a simile draws resemblance with the help of the words like or as. Neglected, mute and slate are you like ruined monument on desert plain. Like ruined monument. See, like ruined monuments means here he is using the literary device simile. Personification is used. Personification is the and uh, yet another poetry uh, literary device uh, he used in the the poet used in the poem. Personification is a figure of speech in which a thing, an idea, or an animal is given human attributes. That means giving uh, the first letter would be capital, or we'll address that uh, uh, thing which we. Uh, personify like a human being why hangs thou lonely must thou there remain actually this poetry is we know that it's an inanimate object or uh, the culture tradition all those are inanimate objects but uh harp uh here he, he used harp harp is an inanimate object but he's addressing the harp and considering it as a uh, human being that's why we um that's why we are saying he has used personification in this do we call a uh, do we call a harp a you because we know that it's an inanimate object but he is considering it as a, a person that is why he uh, address it as you and you like that the next one is the third one is synecdoche Scenic decayments is a literary device in which a part of something represents the whole. A part of something represents the whole or it may use a whole to represent a part. It can also in both of the, uh, it can also be used in both of the way. That is, a part can be representing the whole or the whole can be representing a small part. Sinek decay may also use larger groups to refer to smaller groups or vice versa. Here, many a hand. Many a hand, those hands are called. Hand means just a part of a human body. But by using hand, by using the word hand, he is not uh, referring to just a hand, but the hand of a poet. So here, just a part of a poet is used, is representing the whole here, poet, the poetic community. Many a hand means many uh, a poetic community, many poets. Those hands are called means those hands of a poet are called now. The poetic community. Okay, that's it. Um, and um, thank you for listening to um, the class. Thank you.